had a certain concept of uh, what a fresco was, and now I know that was completely wrong. Some people say, well, you know, man has been to the moon, or uh, this certain type of artwork has already been done. Well, for me, it's the first time, and I've never experienced this before, and I'm like an explorer. Well, I'm excited about putting it together and seeing what happens. It's exciting. The work comes to life, it's sort of a building process. Applying the paint on a wet plaster is it's like a, a form of magic to me. The Arts Foundation developed this fresco workshop because it is an important um, uh, part of our history. Fresco making is an important part of our history and our culture, but is rapidly disappearing from the contemporary art curricula. And we felt it was vitally important that we bring in master fresco makers to teach other qualified artists to carry on in this tradition, hopefully that they would carry on in the fresco tradition. We were fortunate enough to bring in Stephen Dimitrov and his wife Lucien Block who were apprentices to Diego Rivera when he created the, the famous master frescoes at the Detroit Institute of Arts. They also went on and worked with uh, Diego on the Rockefeller Project in New York and other projects. They've been doing fresco for 60 years and have just a wonderful wealth of information and experience under their belts. I want you to know that I started learning fresco in 1932 in the museum right back there. Because Diego Rivera was painting. He always talked through that grill up there. Did he? Oh, yeah. Diego would be doing something, and he would holler from there. There'd be conversation in Spanish between the two of them. And I started grinding colors on a piece of glass that was 36 inches square with a piece of marble that was honed, well high polished. And I started around 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I ground until 5 o'clock, and my arms fell off. After two weeks of grinding colors, I was put into the, the job of mixing the fourth coat and the fifth coat, because that's what we plastered for Diego every day. By the way, I was with him for an entire year, and we have to tell you, that in Detroit, Diego averaged 18, 20 hours at a stretch. Well, he told me also once, I said, you know, Diego, why do you paint for so long a time? And he said, uh, I like the pressure. I do better work when I'm under pressure. That's the kind of a technique it is. And if you love to paint, there's nothing better. In watercolor, you can always start over again. In oil, you can do it all over again. Not in fresco. And Lucien is an absolute expert at it, and she loves it. Tell That's true, you. sweetie. Thank you. May I shake hands with you? We were also very fortunate enough to have uh, Rick and Debbie Zuccarini, who were Stephen and Lucien's apprentices for several years, who live in Detroit. So the four of them got together and decided on what the syllabus would be and how this whole workshop would, you know, unfold. And here we are today um, in a very successful uh, workshop. We're very pleased. What I want to tell you is that we're going to teach you talk about, show you how you do fresco. We're going to sh show you how you plaster. And we want you to know that the first three coats in fresco, you can hire a plasterer, a good plasterer, and you show him how you want it plastered. And if he knows his business, he will do it exactly as you tell him. This is just like regular craft paper only. Instead of being a piece of paper with tar on both sides, you got tar with two pieces of paper on both sides. The tar will bleed through the plaster. So uh, this keeps that from happening. And then this forms a moisture barrier, so anything, any moisture that might penetrate from behind won't. It's very important with plaster. Water is uh, plaster's worst enemy.
This is expanded metal lath, it's called. This is pretty nasty stuff. You probably should wear gloves. I have a number of pair of gloves if anybody wants any. It looks like you just throw this on the wall, but there's a top and a bottom. And if you see how this forms little cups yep. to hold your plaster, right. so your plaster will come and grip on like this. Yeah. So this is, this is right. If you had it the other way, this way, you don't get those cups. It just falls right off. Okay. So there is an up and a down. Right. In fact, we should mark the panel bottom <laughs> so we know. It's nasty stuff. You got to be careful when you work with it. It'll really tear you up. Uh, plaster supply. Um, it's not really a builder's square item. Okay, you want to go about every eight inches and then along here, you want to get both edges of this. Oh. Make sure the edges are down. Where you've got a joint here? Yeah. You want to put one at both ends of the joint. Okay, so just one more here. We stand it up, we'll swing it around and stand it against the wall. Fresco is a very ancient method. Somebody discovered that when you paint a lime while well, it was wet, uh, the color is fused with the lime, and when it dries, it's like soft rock. But it's colored rock instead of being just white rock or gray rock. Uh, the good lime is usually made out of white, cheap marble. In our particular case, we use uh, high calcium hydrated Hydrated means powdered form that's been dried. And we buy that from masonry shops, from hardware stores, from lumber yards. I've had lime that's 40 years old. I've used all of it except maybe uh, two quarts. I've, I have sold some of it. And I sold at a very high price to try to teach those who buy it from me to make their own. The way it used to be done is I would dig a lime pit and put it in for my grandson and I would be using the lime out of my grandfather's lime pit. The longer it sits, the more elastic it becomes. Master fresco painters during the Renaissance wouldn't even touch it if it wasn't three, four years old. Minimum, absolute minimum. So we're using two-year-old lime for this. For the final coat, we're gonna use some uh, eight-year-old lime. Listen carefully. The first coat is one part of lime, one part of cement. We recommend white Portland cement. Portland is means an island in, off the English coast, but never mind, you can use ordinary cement. It, one part of cement, one part of lime, and two parts of sand, or part and a half of sand, whatever you want to use. Mix it up nicely, plaster it on something that has a tooth so the wall will hold, and wait a week. Just start off down in a corner. Work it a little bit. And then you wanna you wanna work in different directions. Not always draw it on up and then go across and come back. So you're working it together. Yeah.
The mix changes this time to um, one part lime, two parts sand. And then we carry this through the second, third, and fourth coat will all be mixed the same. This is two year old lime. It's been sitting in water for two years. to this mixture because there's a, enough here in the line. We don't want this plaster to be too wet. Then it'll crack when it dries. What, uh, what's going to happen here is this coat, this plaster has what's called a wicking action. And it draws moisture away from the surface into it. This coat is going to suck the moisture out of the next coat. And that's what's going to make this bond to one solid block. So what we have to do before we start plastering is we've got to start that wicking action. So we have to wet down this whole area we're going to work on as we go. And this, you don't want it too wet, but you can see how the moisture is just getting soaked right into the wall, drawn right in. If this isn't done, what happens is as you start to apply your next coat, the plaster will just grab and it will just, ugh, you won't be able to move it. With, by doing this, it frees it up a little bit and starts that wicking action. Starting from the bottom and just Draw it up to an even, even thickness. Come back with a straight edge and just run it up and down and use it like a screed and make sure that my surface is flat. Just take off the highs. All that's good stuff. Still use it. Now this is just a piece of wood with a handle on it. Basically that's all it is. This happens to be a piece of redwood, but you could just pick up a piece of two by four and use it, it really doesn't matter. And we just, as the word says, we just want to float this over the surface. You don't use a lot of pressure, you go in a circular motion. This will knock off what's high, you can see it taking some off. And by changing the texture of the wall, it lets you know what's low, you can see the low spot. So what you want to do is feed a little plaster into the low spots, float it out smooth.
first you trace it. Oh. You trace the drawing that's on the last. Oh, I gotcha. Oh. And that way you just transfer the larger. And then you've got it written on your sketch. And then you can have anybody who doesn't even know how to draw can take one of the sections and copy. Well, you, you do it on the third layer because the fourth and fifth coat go on together. Okay. That's actually, will go on as, as one coat on the same layer. Because uh, you, you work slowly and uh, the wall dries fast. So you can be very hard to do it all in one day. I mean, Rivera would paint one life piece like that in one day. But uh, in this class, you have to have a little more. None of us are Diego Rivera. <laughs> if it doesn't fit exactly, don't worry, because that's part of uh, doing it as artists, not as machinists. Right. You don't have to worry, it won't fit exactly. <laughs> We're just getting it close. And just take turns, whoever will fit up there. Take the square. You want everybody to do so that you don't You want to hear it? Yeah. 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 Very cheap paper, I didn't buy it. Oh, look. Um, yeah. Were you asking the question? Yeah. We have a layer to put on here, but I don't say it's not a place to have else is that. We've done this. Right. Now we're going to. Are we all done? Yeah. I think we'll find out. Watch her. She's starting. Oh. <laughs> this is. Um, Raw sienna, no, what am I saying? Burnt sienna with water, the powder with the water, that's all. I would buy the paint, cheap paint at the hardware store, as long as it's nice and red and water. And once you put it on there, it's, not, it's waterproof. Because you're going to put water on there. Even if it runs after you've traced it, you don't care what happens to it after that. Because that's what you, you that's, that's what you want to do. Suppose I don't like, suppose I don't like that. I don't you like can, that. She'll change your mind, you watch. Okay. She, she, she'll, <laughs> she'll change your mind here and there, after, after she gets tired of it. Now she's following the sketch, but she'll get tired and she'll change her mind. I know. <laughs> so this, what she's doing now, is very important, even if you change your mind completely when you start, you've got a beginning. It's the beginning that you've got to think of. We want you to learn from this class, if possible, the importance of how to plaster, when to plaster, what the mixtures are, so that you can teach somebody to do a lot of these things for you. Because all you want to do is paint. And that's hard enough in itself. Even if you're a genius, I'm telling you. He'll need some help. Yep. I'll take the tube.
Okay. I haven't done this roof line. I guess I'll do this fence down here. We got, mm -hmm. and then we'll take it down there. Kind of tore it there. Yeah, she said try to avoid it, but <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Tearing, tearing the paper it. when you do turns and things yeah, like that, yeah, it kind yeah. of will rip us. When you're no, this is the fourth coat. This is two lime or one lime to two sand. You're right. Speaking too fast. Okay, we're gonna go to here, right? That's not of that nature. <coughs> And then I cut that. Yeah, there. that's right. Okay. Now, if we're going to go to here, we want to wet it out a little farther than that. And when we plaster, we're going to plaster two, three inches bigger than that because the edges will dry. these coats, actually they go on together and this is called the Intonico. Intonico. Intonaco. It depends on where you come from, how you say it, but that's the way I say it. <laughs> I always go over the plaster like this just to make sure that there's no big white lumps. Any clumps of lime, is, they're going to form what's called hot spot. It'll It'll dry fast. So you don't want any big clumps of lime in there. Okay. Now, once you start doing this, just load your trowel to what you can handle. If this is too much, then don't load this much on there. You know, this is to your individual uh, feel. Well, in this, because the way we're doing this here, I'm going to start from the bottom. If, say, if we were just doing this piece here, then I would just, I would start here. Yeah, I usually, you usually plaster from the bottom up. Yeah. right next to it. And then you don't really have to put pressure on the float. You just let it do it on its own. Well, I'm just doing this little bit. If I were doing this on my own, I'd probably plaster about this big and then float it and then go on to the next section. But I'm just, I'm, you guys are going to do this. Do it before you start. Let me just squeeze a little more water. Let's pull this out a little bit so you can get behind it. There you are. Just that was a little bit dry under there. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, somebody wants to try it there. Okay. 
Okay, then you go this way. That's one way. Go ahead. Okay. But don't don't twist it up with pressure, because you're twisting the whole thing off. That's good. That's good enough. Okay, now get hold of the straight edge right there. Now let me show you how I do it. Hold this. Watch me. I'm taking the high spots. Yeah. Are you pushing? What? Are you pushing oh, it in? A little now? bit, a little bit. Then you do it this way. What you want to do is you got to get it straight. Don't push too hard. Just gent yeah. gently. You're just taking the mountains off. Just keep going up. That's right. Dip it in the water and keep going up. Look, uh, let me show you how I would do it. I would go like this. See, I try to get a little bit. Go this way. See, I'm scratching it and pushing it. Do that. Okay, now you gotta be careful you're not working too much. These guys are good. <laughs> That's a beautiful way of doing it. Go ahead. That's it. That's it. That's it. Another thing, this is important, everybody. From this point on, no palm of the hand. This wall will suck the oil out of your hand. You'll come up with a spot while you're painting that your color will just beat up on. So for the fourth and fifth coat, you only use the back of your hand to touch it with. A lot of what you got to get over with, it was like yesterday when we were mixing. You know, it's just lime and sand, but everybody would just yeah. gently mix it. You know, you got to beat this stuff up. Yeah, just beat it up. You can't hurt it. Tomorrow, everybody, you'll be surprised. You'll all be 10 times better. You'll just understand what you're doing better. What you want on this coat is flat. That top coat goes on thin. It's just a skin coat. Just, you know, it goes on quick and fast. So you want to be as smooth as you can be with this coat. But I think we're already beyond that. <laughs> Good enough. I had to inspect it. <laughs> it's, it's very good. <clears throat> As he said, he could work another hour on it. And I could do the same thing because I see little, little spots that I want to fill in and then float again with the floater. What he's doing now is cleaning around. We wasted a terrific amount of stuff. <laughs> if I was doing this a commercial job, we would have two or three pieces that will be on the floor and no more. We'd have We'd newspapers. <laughs> what we're going to do now is let it set for a while. And the way you tested it, if it's wet, 